Imagine a simple electrical machine in front of me. If I rotate its rotor by hand and supply mechanical power, it starts working as a generator, producing electricity. But if I connect a 12 volt supply to its terminals, the same machine switches rolls. Now it runs as a motor giving mechanical output from the rotor. In short, this one device can act both as a generator and a motor. It performs both jobs with remarkable efficiency. Now let's take this principle to a much bigger scale. Imagine a battery that can store energy in gigawatts, enough to power entire cities. This battery is not made of chemicals. It is completely natural and can last for nearly a century. We call it the Pumped Storage Hydroelectric Power Plant. For comparison, take a lithium-ion battery system. A typical setup may store about 150 megawatts and connects directly to the power grid. When charging, electricity from the grid, which is in AC, that's alternating current, is first converted into DC, that's direct current, using a rectifier. This current passes through the battery management system, or the BMS, which monitors and charges each cell carefully. When discharging, the stored DC flows through an inverter and is converted back into AC for grid use. But every conversion step creates energy losses. The biggest challenge with chemical batteries is temperature control. During charging and discharging, their cells must stay between 15 degrees Celsius and 35 degrees Celsius. If they get too hot or too cold, efficiency drops quickly. Worse, poor thermal management can even create a serious fire hazard. To control temperature, engineers use air cooling or liquid cooling systems. But here lies the real problem. These cells last only about 15 years. After that, the entire battery pack has to be replaced. This makes large-scale power storage with chemical batteries both costly and difficult. But there is a much better solution. The Pumped Storage Hydroelectric Plant. It can store energy on the scale of gigawatts, enough for entire cities. Here, energy is stored in the form of water so it never degrades with time. And because the plant generates electricity directly as AC or alternating current, there is no need for repeated conversions between AC and DC, which saves energy. Traditionally, these plants are built in hilly regions where flowing rivers and steep height differences make the setup easier. But today, engineers can also create closed-loop systems, artificial reservoirs built specifically for storing and cycling water, without relying on natural rivers. The process begins with a dam built to hold water in a reservoir. Instead of letting the water escape through open channels, engineers fit huge steel pipes inside the dam. These pipes are called penstocks, and they guide water downwards with controlled flow. The penstock pipe runs downhill, sometimes 2 to 3 kilometers long, until it reaches the lower reservoir. At its end sits a control valve. This keeps the water sealed until power is needed. Behind this valve, water builds up with enormous pressure because the penstock can be 8 to 10 meters wide, depending on the height difference between the two reservoirs. If the height gap between reservoirs is small, the plant is called a low head plant. Here, gravity creates less pressure, so engineers use wider penstock pipes to allow more water through. But if the height is large, gravity itself creates powerful pressure. In that case, narrower pipes are enough to deliver the same force to the turbines. Just after the valve stands a giant turbine, usually a Francis turbine, one of the most common hydro turbines in the world. When the valve opens, high-speed water rushes in and strikes the turbine blades with immense force, making them spin. After turning the blades, the water flows out safely into the downstream channel. In simple terms, the turbine turns water energy into rotation. Its shaft is directly connected to the rotor of a synchronous generator. As the rotor spins, its magnetic poles cut across the stator windings, creating electricity. So the turbine's mechanical energy becomes electrical energy, just like the small machine I showed earlier. This electrical machine is called a synchronous generator. Right now it is running in generator mode. The electricity it produces is first sent to a transformer, where the voltage is stepped up. From there, it flows into the substation ready to be supplied to homes, factories and cities. Here's an important point. As the upper reservoir empties, the water level, called the head, drops. This reduces the pressure of water reaching the turbine, which lowers the plant's output power. But the speed and frequency of the generator stay the same. That's because a synchronous generator is always locked to the grid frequency. The voltage may rise or fall slightly, but the frequency remains fixed by the grid. In most of Asia, Europe and Africa, the grid frequency is 50 Hz. 
In North America and some other countries, it is 60 Hz. For this explanation, let's use the 50 Hz system, since that is standard across many regions. The demand on the grid keeps changing with time. To balance this, an automatic governor adjusts the control valve, increasing or reducing water flow so the generator matches the grid's needs. But if the valve is shut suddenly, a violent pressure wave called water hammer can strike inside the pent stock pipe. To prevent damage, engineers build a surge tank which lets water rise upwards instead of stopping abruptly. This simple design protects the pen stock from dangerous pressure surges. And if the reservoir is large enough, several generator units can be installed side by side. This multiplies the power output and makes the plant more reliable. After leaving the turbine, the water is collected in the lower reservoir. If it comes from a flowing mountain river and released downstream, the system works as a regular hydroelectric power plant. But when used as a battery, the lower reservoir is kept closed, storing the water there. Once the upper reservoir is empty and all the water has moved down, we say the battery is fully discharged. To recharge the battery, water must be pumped back into the upper reservoir. This creates two challenges. First, we need a powerful pump. Second, that pump itself will require a lot of electricity. But here's the smart part. We don't need a separate motor and pump. The Francis turbine is designed to work in both directions. As a turbine when water flows down and as a centrifugal pump when water needs to be pushed up. In this pumping mode, the synchronous machine takes electricity from the grid and runs as a motor, spinning the turbine in reverse to push water back uphill. As the turbine spins in pumping mode, it pushes water from the lower reservoir back to the top. Here, the motor efficiency is about 96 to 98%, and the combined pump turbine system works at roughly 90% efficiency. When running as a generator, the performance is equally impressive. The generator itself achieves 98 to 99% efficiency, and with the turbine included, the overall efficiency stays around 93%. So whether it acts as a motor or a generator, the synchronous machine delivers outstanding efficiency in both roles. There is one key detail to remember. In hydro and pumped storage plants, the synchronous machine usually runs at only 250 to 300 RPM. Why so slow? Because it uses a salient pole rotor. On this type of rotor, the poles are widely spaced with large air gaps. If it spins too fast, the rotor can become unstable. To solve this, engineers keep the turbine speed low and increase the number of poles on the rotor, while still keeping the output locked to the grid frequency of 50 Hz. The speed is decided by a simple formula. Speed is equal to 120 into frequency divided by number of poles. With the frequency fixed at 50 Hz, a 4-pole rotor would spin at 1500 RPM. But such high speed is impractical in hydro plants. So instead, the rotor is built with 24 poles, which brings the speed down to about 250 RPM, safe and reliable for this kind of system. Here's something important. The generator's speed does not affect its power output. Whether the rotor spins fast or slow, the plant can still deliver the same power in megawatts or gigawatts, as long as the design conditions are right. The deeper working of a synchronous machine is an advanced topic, We'll cover that in a separate video. But another big question remains. Where does the electricity come from to pump the water back up? Look at this graph of solar energy and grid demand. From midnight until about 8 a.m., the grid alone carries the load, so the curve looks flat. After 8 a.m., solar power rises and grid demand falls as the sun begins supporting the system. By around 3 p.m., solar output declines again and the grid has to pick up the full load. Between 6 p.m. and 9 p.m., demand peaks sharply, just as solar generation drops to zero. Each year, solar generation keeps growing. Because of this, the grid load between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. is steadily dropping. In simple terms, solar energy often produces more electricity than the grid needs, leaving a big surplus. When this excess power is available, electricity companies are happy to sell it even at discounted rates. That's the perfect time to run a pumped storage plant and push water back to the upper reservoir. This charging window usually lasts seven to eight hours, giving the plant about six to seven hours of battery backup. 
and during these hours, the electricity needed for pumping is much cheaper. After 6 p.m., electricity demand rises sharply and the grid comes under heavy stress. By this time, our pumped storage plant has already charged its battery. Water is waiting in the upper reservoir. Now the plant switches back on, and the water flows down again. The turbine spins and the motor works in generator mode, supplying much needed electricity to the grid. And because this happens during peak hours, the electricity produced can also be sold at a higher market price. Unlike chemical batteries, water never expires. That's why a pumped storage plant can keep running for 50 to even 100 years, needing only routine maintenance of the generator, turbine, and dam. Over an 80-year lifespan, the average storage cost of lithium-ion batteries is about 68 US dollars per megawatt hour delivered, while pumped storage comes to around 60 USD per megawatt hour delivered. The numbers may shift slightly depending on assumptions, but in the long run, pumped storage is clearly more economical. And when we look at the environment, lithium-ion batteries cause much higher emissions and mining damage than pumped storage. Mining lithium, cobalt, and other rare materials also risks depleting natural reserves, while pumped storage runs cleanly for decades once built. I hope this video has given you a clear understanding of how a pumped storage hydroelectric power plant works like a giant natural battery. If you still have any questions or suggestions, drop them in the comments below. I'd love to hear from you. And don't forget to subscribe.